Martinez uh, enough time to share her work. So let me begin by welcoming everyone. Welcome to our GoCal Fellowship Career Development Webinar for the month of February. So wherever you are, greetings. It could be good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jay Lee. I'm the site PI for the UCLA campus. And I'm here to introduce our esteemed speaker today. So let me just um, give you just a brief intro. So Professor Beatriz Martinez Lopez is a professor in the Department of Medicine and Epidemiology Agricultural Experiment Station, um, and also the director of the UC Davis Center for Animal Disease Modeling and Surveillance. Uh, Dr. Uh, Martinez's uh, research has focused on the development and application of epidemiological tools for supporting more cost-effective and risk-based surveillance and control strategies. And she's been really focusing on working on um, epi-modeling and risk assessment for the evaluation of potential introduction and spread of disease affecting domestic and wild animal populations. Um, many diseases, including foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, classical swine fever, West Nile, among many other diseases. And um, I would say that many of the diseases are considered to be emerging or re-emerging due to globalization changes in climate and land use. So it's a real privilege for me to welcome uh, Dr. Beatriz Martinez Lopez, and I would turn the floor over to Beatriz. And I think I think the format is. Um, she will share her, her wisdom, her work, and, and her advice, and I think we'll leave. Uh, Richard, is it like past uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes for Q&A? Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. So, Beatrice, welcome, and take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee. Yeah, it's really a great pleasure to be here today, and thank you so much for the nice introduction and the invitation. It's, it's really, uh, again, an honor to, to talk a little bit about my, I, I would say my career uh, and my experience and how I got here uh, basically. So I was asked to travel back in time, let's say, and, and explain um, all my career path. And here you can see in the map, like the three main important places that play a role in, in my career. Spain, where I am from, I did most of my DDM degrees. Uh, UK, that it was supposed to be my postdoc uh, research place, but I had some accident there, had to go back to Spain. I, I broke my knee ligament there, <laughs> playing rugby, not recommended uh, to enjoy rugby. <laughs> and, and then UC Davis, which uh, was a place where I did my master's, but also I ended up in, you know, getting the, the professor and employment. So let's get started it's just very briefly with my background. So I'm a veterinarian, so I did my BVM degree in the Complutense University of Madrid. It's the oldest vet school in Spain, and it's uh, the largest one as well. It has um, like around 1,100 uh, students in, in the vet school and around 268 professors, more or less. Um, I was meant to be an equine practitioner, to be honest, uh, but things changed in life. So uh, and I was passionate about horses and I did all my best to get into that world. But then I realized that, you know, this degree has many other opportunities and some of them are, are extremely excited. So still, you know, very touch uh, and working a little bit in, in equine diseases, but now more in, in a more global, um, you know, epidemiology and public health perspective. Um, then I did my master's. So what happened is that I was offered a PhD in, in, in Madrid, uh, but one of my co-advisors uh, was actually from UC Davis and he highly encouraged me to do this master's. Um, here at UC Davis. So I just kind of did a break in my PhD and I came here to do the Masters of Preventive Veterinary Medicine with, you know, some of the people that were Wes Johnson was a Bayesian statistician, Andres Perez, uh, who was a really well-known uh, epidemiologist at that time. And I really enjoyed it a lot this year, not only because, you know, the, the nature and, and the fascinating outdoor opportunities uh, but of course also about the masters and it was really a transformative experience. Then I went back to Spain. I finished my PhD in, in my laboratory. It was 
in the Visa Vet Laboratory, which is the OIE reference laboratory for different diseases, African horse sickness and African swine fever, and, and also European laboratory for bovine tuberculosis. So it was a big team of people. Uh, they have a BSL-3 laboratory level and a lot of opportunities. And, and there is where I developed my, my thesis, basically in quantitative methods in epidemiology. After that, I did my postdoctoral research again with a European uh, project. Part of that project was supposed to be in the UK, but when I arrived after three months, again, I broke my knee, so I decided to come back to Spain and, and continue my postdoctoral research in, in Spain. Um, I, I got a national competitive research uh, contract, which is uh, basically a research position in the National Wildlife Research Institute. So I started to work a little bit um, you know, in the area of the wildlife, domestic and human interface with zoonotic pathogens. It's very interesting experience. And, and then I start, you know, uh, getting a lot of uh, additional publications and contacts. So it was a very productive time. Uh, I got also um, a really uh, nice uh, small teaching uh, assignment in, in a faculty that it was in Valencia at the time uh, as an associate professor. So I was giving epidemiology to the to the students there, and I had the opportunity also to teach many other classes um, in, in, in Spain, in different institutions, in the University of Castilla-La Mancha, and, and other courses and seminars and abroad. So I was kind of really preparing for academic, um, I would say, path. I was certain that my, you know, at some point I, I really wanted to um, you know, jump and, and, and go into academia. Um, I, I was, you know, having, after my vet school, I did some practice in, in livestock and in swine industry, but I really wanted to go back and, and continue with research. So my path was clearly um, academic um, or research oriented. So during that time, I, I tried to publish as much as possible. But that's really a recommendation I, I give you guys to like, try really to produce as many publications for has to be high quality publications, but this is what really talks about, you know, the research that you do and is when you start becoming more known uh, nationally and internationally. So it's important that, you know, all that, all the efforts that you do try to publish them um, and, and get, you know, um, some, some nice work um, documented and, and published out there. So I did a lot of work on that, uh, I got involved in many different projects during that time, um, projects of you know some of the teams that we were working with, um, and also some projects that I put myself. So I was able to do a lot of funding capture and, and you know I start exploring um, you know the, the opportunity to to be a leader actually in research. Um, also in teaching, I had again a lot of teaching material that really helped me a lot. Um, for many things, I was able to produce um, videos, for example, digital simulations. We will talk a little bit about that. And I was really passionate <clears throat> about teaching. So I really wanted to, you know, get involved in, in some environment where I could train next generation, you know, veterinarians and epidemiologists and, and, and try to work together in this environment that is so intellectually uh, interesting, right? And, and again, I think that I probably learn more from my students than my students probably learn from me. So uh, I was really interested on, on combining both worlds. So after that, um, well, th there were many things going on at the time. Um, I don't know if you remember, but there was the economic downturn and the economic crisis in Europe. It was a big, um, you know, a situation, I would say in Spain, many people said, look, I don't think that we're gonna open any jobs anytime soon for professors in, in, you know, in academia and so on. So basically many people in my generation were kind of forced a little bit on thinking about other opportunities probably abroad. So I started you know, looking for places in, in other places in Europe and also in the US um, where I could actually achieve you know, my, uh, my goals and, and my, my career development. Uh, so the first opportunity came to Davis and, and I was able to interview well and, and it got the job. So I was uh, really excited to go back to Davis uh, where I had my master's and, and it was a really uh, exciting time. So um, basically I started in Tabor Hall, this, this 
kind of building in the in the vet school, and you know from there I moved to associate professor and then full professor. And during this time has been extremely intensive. I arrived approximately 2013. My position started officially in 2014, in January 2014. At that time, I also became director of the Center for Animal Disease Modern and Surveillance because the center was actually looking for someone to, to lead the center for, for a while. So I decided to take both both jobs at the same time, not recommended with when you are assistant professor, definitely. So <laughs> I would probably think differently and, you know, uh, now, but, but it was really a great opportunity because CADMS, this, this center I'm directing, it was the place where I met all the people of my mentors when I was doing the masters. And it was really a privilege to be able to direct that center uh, now that I was going back. Uh, so I, we uh, start to kind of build up uh, the team um, and, and now we have approximately 22 people working in the center, a lot of publications like 10, 15 per year, more or less, and, and a lot of funding capture. Mostly my funding uh, sources are yeah, NSF, National Science Foundation, USDA, some NIH, not many, but some NIH as well, and particularly contracts or service agreements or contracts with the industry. We, we work a lot very closely with the industry. All right, so during this time, I really had an amazing opportunity to work with many interdisciplinary teams um, talking and speaking many different languages. Uh, both when I was in Spain, I was in the OIE reference laboratory for several diseases. So we have a lot of international collaborations. We work in transgender and zoonotic medical diseases at the wild domestic interface. We also work in many different topics and models and you know, quantitative methods like risk assessment, modeling, that analysis, geostatistical tools, and, and of course with different people. So I, I really, from the very beginning of my PhD to postdoctoral studies and so on, I was really excited to work with different types of stakeholders and you know, public health and officials, veterinary services, private vets, and all, all kinds of policymakers, insurance companies, laboratories, and, and so on. So it was a very uh, interesting, and I came up with the um, thought or, or really the idea that we definitely need to come up with a global strategy for approaching uh, the prevention and control of infectious diseases in general. We definitely need to integrate interdisciplinary teams with different cultural perspectives, as well as different uh, you know, backgrounds and, and, and skills and expertise to really be able to successfully tackle this problem. So why we think it's important this global strategy and, and I really made it the point of my career um, in terms of, you know, moving forward to form my own team and working in my own, uh, uh, you know, research environment. Well, I think that we, I mean, we are here, I'm here in a Zoom meeting now because we are in the middle of a pandemic. I think that this explains quite a lot, right? We, we are experiencing a lot of changes globally, not just on you know, environmental factors, climate change, globalization, increase on human animal demographics, and exchange of uh, woods and, and even, for example, illegal trade of animals. Um, or you know, changes in economy, religion, politics, all these really impact um, the, the emergence of infectious diseases. And we have uh, seen this pandemic, but many more probably will come and, and we will experience more challenges in the future. Um, the, the problem is that we are increasing the interaction. You know, in the past we had, you know, probably you were spending, I don't know, 30 days to go from one country to another by plane, by, well, I would say by, by boat, okay? Now in hours, you can be in three different continents. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing. And, and of course, the same with woods, you know, animal products and with animals, the same with vectors and that they move sometimes really quickly as well. So we are really increasing the interaction and facilitating that interaction. And we are invading ecosystems that were not invaded in the past. So we, we are really forcing uh, you know, and, and, and facilitating the crossover of uh, pathogens across the species. So the problem with that is that, you know, we have seen this is a paper that was in nature, included here, the COVID-19, um, you know, the SARS, uh, the new SARS virus, uh, but many more will, will 
occur. And 75% of emerging diseases are zoonoses. That means that they are coming from the animals and, and there is some spillover event um, at some point it's possible to, to have the transmission and the cross species, uh, the, the cross barrier of species. So, so we really need to think about how we can better achieve these uh, without one health um, perspective. Right now we are focusing on, yeah, the doctors, public health, but we could have prevent this probably if we were really looking at early detection in the animal compartment and um, so so we need to definitely integrate this um, you know human animal and environmental health together so really the main problem is that you know there were several studies and this is this was done in europe but applies to many places in which uh, we realize that once you have a disease in in one particular country usually an emerging disease the disease is usually circulating one to three months before the first detection. So the time to detection in the field is really, really delayed. And, and we have amazing laboratories. Once the sample, you know, you have a suspicious the sample arrives to the lab, probably in hours, you can say, yes, I have this pathway. But the sample has to arrive to the lab. And that doesn't happen after one to three months after you have the first infection sometimes. So early detection is definitely key and we are not very good at that. We are not improving surveillance or early detection mechanisms to really identify what's going on in the first place. So what could we do with this? Again, the, the, my idea was, well, we definitely need this global strategy, integrating interdisciplinary teams, one health, integrating field, epi and laboratory teams together, also that sometimes the communication is not as good. Um, and we definitely need to work in, in, a, in a more holistic way to, to attack uh, this problem. So the global strategy for my program in general, for my vision of um, how we should be working in terms of uh, epidemiology infectious diseases, it's, it's based on three pillars, basically. First is prevention, how we improve prevention. Uh, the first thing is try to identify you know, areas where we should focus our attention. We have so many pathogens, so many diseases, it's really hard to really have resources and money for all of them. So can we try to do some risk-based strategies that are usually much more cost-effective and we can really target areas where we think we have higher likelihood to have uh, problems. So those risks can be identified with many different factors and many different tools risk assessment, risk mapping, risk factor analysis, network analysis, and, and so on. I put some of the samples here of things that we are doing. This is going to help us to better design this based surveillance. So once we have this, we can really um, work together with stakeholders and, and come up with the risk-based strategies that are more cost-effective. Even some of them could be multi-purpose surveillance. We have multiple diseases potentially be discovered in the same surveillance program. Uh, so again, we need more sensitive and hopefully more cost-effective uh, programs. Now, if the problem is already here and it's already emerging and popping, then we definitely have to have good tools for early detection in the field. So either, again, early detection in those communities that are primarily affected, that sometimes, again, maybe underserved communities, maybe areas that are not quite covered by surveillance because they are really, really remote and so on. But we need to have some way to early detect those problems and track that in the region. Real-time monitoring is really a dream. It's not there yet, but probably in the future after what we have seen in COVID and so on, and with new technologies is going to come up uh, at least for animal health and, and maybe also in human health with you know some of the wearable devices and so on so we are moving towards you know uh, probably a next dimension of uh, early detection monitoring systems uh, and also as soon as we early detect we have to rapid control so we need to have control programs that are able to really control quickly this and for that we need to just develop many times you know disease spread models to understand the magnitude and duration of the problem in different scenarios and try to design the programs based on those scenarios. Uh, we should also have vaccine bags or, or try to come up with strategies to develop quickly vaccines and being able to implement vaccination programs effect effectively. And also we can use other things like level analysis for example, try to understand how the contacts uh, occur and how we can 
you know, compartmentalize the individual networks basically to avoid transmission. So this is definitely important. Now, teaching plays a crucial role, I would say, in both prevention and control. And so I think that what we need also to do is um, training next generation experts in this area. And you guys are within this uh, compartment, I would say, uh, next leaders in, in global health in more transformative, um, again, holistic uh, way of thinking in terms of preventing and controlling uh, human and animal diseases. So for these, it's very important, not just training like, you know, courses, seminar, uh, but also simulations. So I also use some examples we did with some veterinarian officials, like how you do real simulations or and um, you know, um, try to test at uh, the time of response uh, what the people will do in a real uh, scenario if, if you know the, the outbreak was happening and so on. Um, very important also. Oh, sorry. Is try to incorporate all the people that has to be there and and. For, I would say increase the collaboration between those compartments. Again, veterinarians, they play a very important role in food safety and animal health. Uh, definitely they keep our pets healthy, but the, the main objective of, of the vets at the end of the day is contributing to human health. Uh, so we are trying to uh, you know, be the first uh, body many times to avoid you know, issues, the spillover uh, of diseases from animals to humans and uh, also um, you know, from products like food, food related and contaminations to humans. So we need more collaboration between those areas and, and more transparency also in terms of sharing information and so on. Okay, and then risk awareness and perception, definitely consumers, you know, general public in general, and we, we need to really be able to communicate well. Some of the things that we learned with COVID, for example, is that sometimes it's, it's really difficult <clears throat> to find like one unique expert or voice that is the one that you know we trust and, and we believe is, is the one that's going to provide uh, the real um, or, or the correct information we're hearing right it's many times the politicians talk and, and other people talk but uh, we really need to trust those that are the experts basically and, and try to have those individuals um, in leadership roles uh, for risk communication and, and awareness so Okay, how is my work on this? I think again, yeah, by doing this, working on prevention, working on control, doing research in these areas, but also teaching in these areas and, and contributing to, again, uh, form the next generation leaders in one health in more holistic systems um, is really the future. So that's what I try to do in my program. And I try to work on that in all the different projects I had. So. For example, one of those projects, um, again, regarding the first part, prevention, free space surveillance, and so on, was really at the beginning of my PhD when, you know, you probably remember some of you have food and mouth disease, gigantic epidemic um, that happened in UK, uh, killed uh, more than 3 billion animals um, only in the UK, so you can imagine it was uh, terrible. But there were many other countries affected, like Ireland, France, and the Netherlands. Spain was not affected by very, very few, actually, 24 hours before uh, a shipment, and actually the, the disease was detected in a point in France, and, and the animals of that point were really going to go to Spain, but they were intercepted just in time. So it was really close to get in, into the country. And again, Spain is one of the largest producers of pigs and, and so on in Europe. So the government uh, wanted to know, okay, what's the risk of food and mouth disease introduction into Spain? Not just on this scenario of UK, that we know that the risk was pretty high. We just, you know, were safe in, in the last minute. But what what could happen in the future as well, um, in other scenarios? So we develop a risk assessment and try to identify which areas of the country had the highest risk, depending on the three patterns that uh, they had. Uh, because again, Ireland, France, and the Netherlands were infected actually by the movement of live animals just before the detection of the disease in the UK. So we developed that project and tried to come up with uh, you know the highest risk points to inform policy making in, in, at that sense. Now, one of the things that we did that was interesting based on this study is um, try to convince, because when, when something like this happened, again, UK, in the case of UK, half of the money of all these killing of animals, burning and, and repopulation 
was paid by UK government, but half of the money was paid by Europe. So basically, if that's a funding um, a strategy, and, and again, many farmers still didn't have enough uh, support to, you know, repopulate their farms. There were a lot of suicides. It was really terrible um, situation, but. One of the questions we had, well, can we have, you know, instead of the government paying everything, can we have the livestock insurance companies covering part of the cost if the disease is potentially introduced? So we did a risk assessment and tried to estimate the cost that the insurance companies had to cover. And if it was a good deal to offer this kind of premium to, to the farmers, because again, it's a very unlikely event. It's like the, you know, severe extreme weather events and you know in agriculture and so on they have insurance for that so these could be similar so we work with insurance companies and basically we came up with a way to insure farms against food and mal disease and other diseases we incorporate in classic and swine fever and so on in, in in the country so it was one of the most pioneer i would say um, studies that was actually directly applicable to to insurance companies and and farmers were really happy with just low premium they were able to cover the, their entire farm space in case these things happen. Okay, another uh, was the work we did with uh, bovine tuberculosis. As you know, bovine tuberculosis is a big deal. It's uh, being eradicated in some countries, still not in others. Like in Europe, UK, Ireland are kind of the worst in terms of prevalence, but Spain is trying to reduce a lot of the prevalence. They're reducing up to 1% more or less of the herd prevalence but some areas still have a really high number of incident uh, cases in, in each farm every year, despite the you know, 48 years of eradication program that is very costly. Um, so approximately, again, 35 million per year you pay on, on this program. So the question here is, okay, what are the risk factors? Why we are not getting rates of this disease yet in the country? Well, how we can identify high risk areas where we can prioritize surveillance and, and the eradication program and try to do something to improve this. So we work with the government in, in particularly in the high risk areas, um, you know, of, of the southeast, uh, southwest part of Spain, which is a Mediterranean landscape is very similar looking uh, to California, basically the same ecosystem. And um, so we have fragment areas with a lot of wildlife. We have, you know, deer, wild boar. We have a lot of endangered species that are actually dying for bovine tuberculosis, like the Iberian lynx. Uh, but also, we have tons of domestic and kind of semi-extensive systems. You can, well, probably you know about Iberian pigs that are free-ranging, uh, delicious Iberian ham, uh, right? For that, uh, we have the bullfighting bulls that are also free-ranging, difficult to handle, difficult to test against tuberculosis, and also extensive beef cattle. But in addition of that, we have hunting, and it's a very hunting popular area. Bush, George Bush, actually, um, the the president was was actually hunting there in, in Spain in some of these hunting estates, um, and and the density of hunting animals in those areas is huge. You can see how many wild boars, how many deer. Some of them are fed artificially, so that's really the main problem. These places we have a lot of aggregation a lot of risk of TB transmission. Some, sometimes we get 50% TB prevalence. So huge transmission probabilities, same with the year of 12% sometimes. So what we can do with this? And the main problem is this complex interaction between you know, semi-domestic um, hunting animals. Again, hunting estates don't have the same legislation that farms. So they are kind of in a limbo in terms of animal health and, and surveillance programs and so on. So we need to identify what, what's going on and try to identify what risk factors we have. So we, we try to do that and, and try to identify which uh, places are the best for targeting interventions. So we did some different models. First, a basic model to identify risk variables in, in Spain, also in uh, maximum entropy, a species distribution model to identify the same thing, try to see the hotspot areas where we can target interventions in each of those high risk species. What we found is that definitely we have risk factors, both for you know, TB occurrence, for new infection and for persistence of tuberculosis in the, in the farm and could be both associated to domestic cattle farms, but also to wildlife and populations. So we do have, you know, 
both risk factors, both in the management part of the animal health in farms, but also in the hunting estates. And this was a very interesting revelation because again, the hunting estates were not regulated in the eradication program. So we forced kind of presenting this evidence, the government to include the hunting estates in the eradication program and the management practice. One of the things that we learned is that we definitely needed uh, to have initiatives aimed to control TB in the wildlife reservoirs. Basically, wildlife reservoirs, we have a very intensive eradication in domestic uh, cattle, like twice a, a year you have every single cattle in the country is uh, tested. They're positive, they're a slaughter. Now, the problem is that that's not happening with wildlife. So the wildlife is, you know, is, is spilling over uh, the problem to, to the domestic and we are spending all this money in domestic but not taking care of the wildlife. So we start to suggest that and, and now they have a very well a control of some wildlife species that are around farms with, you know, colors are trying to track all the home ranges of those animals, the interactions between those animals and domestic. And they're starting to do barriers of separation, like uh, using ponds, for example, for cattle where wild boars cannot access and the other way around. So that is starting to work and it's starting to produce uh, interesting results. Also the incorporation of wildlife reservoirs in the program, that was very evident and suggestion, but they didn't uh, think about it. So again, we have to have joint efforts between all these, you know, policymakers, administrators, animal health, and definitely wildlife managers, farmers, and hunters. So that that was um, one of the things. After this change, this program changed, and we had wildlife reservoirs. The, the incident has gone very down. Still, probably there, you know, we need several years to to really see the impact that this is gonna have. We still have some areas that are not doing very well, but I think it's, it's definitely a much more complete program now. Other things that we did, uh, just jumping a little bit out of Spain now, was uh, working with the Eastern Europe countries, um, uh, particularly in classic and swine fever. We had a lot of collaborations with Bulgaria. Bulgaria was uh, recently incorporated into the European Union. They were trying to improve animal health in the country that was very um, weak after all the years in, 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 you know, under the, the Russian, um, uh, basically, uh, leadership. So they had these Eastern bar pigs, which are like sheep, but in pigs. So basically you have this shepherd um, that is uh, taking the pigs every day out and then they're coming back home at night. Uh, and these pigs are awesome in terms of, uh, you know, animal welfare and, and healthy and so on but sometimes they get in contact with wild boars and they get exposed to classic and swine fever. So we identify which areas could be a high risk for those pigs and to be a, you know, a outside and, and try to come up with strategies um, to handle that in, in, in the country. So we identify high risk areas again, risk maps, uh, overall occurrence of fast, uh, classic and swine fever in the country. That overall was very low. The program worked really well. They were doing vaccination in, in commercial farms. And, and we tried to just identify those places that need to have a little bit more target surveillance um, in the country. So it was also very interesting uh, collaboration. Then, well, I work in many different areas um, uh, combining different methods like cluster analysis, spatial epidemiology, network analysis or movements of animals between different uh, farms and also um, you know, different risk mapping uh, techniques like multi-criteria decision analysis or maximum entropy. Those three together gives you a three-dimensional picture of what's going on in the place. Uh, one example, well, we, we publish uh, different um, papers, methodological papers, how this can work to, for example, to improve animal health in specific areas of Spain, but we use it, for example, for um, African horse sickness uh, for one particular region of, of Spain uh, using this distribution model in certain areas and see how this can impact in animal trade. In this particular case, equine competitions. So we're focusing on how equine competitions could be affected by these uh, movements. We also did a lot of work with the West Nile and Reemergence in Europe. West Nile in you know Europe has been present for many many years. In the U.S. was introduced in, in 1999, but you know then it spread and now it's endemic in the U.S. But but in Europe was relatively uh, a low uh, risk uh, 
and then no too much problematic issue. We don't have a lot of cases in humans. We have some cases in horses, but um, there was a reemergence uh, likely associated to climate change and, and changes um, of the West Nile distribution. And, and, and we had a lot of cases as you can see in many countries. So one of the things that we try to understand is why this is reemerging. What are the high-risk areas in, in specific parts of Spain that they were really worried about? Particularly in this region, um, they had a lot of uh, equine density, and they thought that you know the, the business related with equine competitions and uh, horse production could be really affected. So we trace um, a lot of the birds, for example, that do wintering and, and, and come to our country from uh, West Nile uh, positive locations. And, and we identify high risk areas uh, using also these um, suitability maps uh, um, for monthly uh, presence of the vectors in, in the region. So these give us um, a picture of which areas were at higher risk, we try to identify how this could impact the uh, movement of equine. So you can see some areas like this point here, it receives and moves a lot of horses uh, monthly and annually. So, so it could be a really important place to do surveillance, make sure we have uh, you know, really in place all the early detection mechanisms. Uh, we also check this with surveillance that was done in the region in terms of wild bird surveillance. Are we really testing the right spots? We realized that some areas like this one here was definitely not tested at all, or this one here. So we, we were able to focalize efforts in terms of bird surveillance in, in a more targeted way. And also we check how this could impact potentially human populations. So we, we saw that you know some of the areas in terms of human density were really close to high highly suitable West Nile areas and in the wildlife compartment. So that could affect potentially in humans and they should be prioritized for early detection and prevention. So, okay. so basically, um, yeah, we, we did some of that. We work also with other countries. So I, I hear, here give you just very brief example of, uh, you know, some recent work that we have done avian influenza, but we have done many others um, and working mostly with California and the whole US, but also South Korea. We have a couple of uh, projects with them in avian influenza, early detection of avian influenza using similar techniques. In terms of control and, and disease transmission, we also develop um, some disease spread models basically to address the question like how disease will spread once it's introduced and what's the most cost effective way to control it. So for that, we, we develop an avian based model that allow us to monitor the disease transmission within and between farms. And so this model was done, we tested in different places and, and different diseases and it's working really well. We are still using it for, you know, to be adapted to several diseases even now here in the US. Regarding teaching, I think it's uh, the last pillar I'm gonna focus on and with this uh, we'll open for questions. Uh, I think it's crucial. Point. So you can do a lot of research on you know, prevention, control, uh, different quantitative methods, but again, this needs to um, really reach out ultimately, not just you know, the next generation scientists, but definitely also people in the field, like veterinarians in the field, uh, stakeholders, general public, uh, we definitely need to incorporate them and make them be part of the surveillance programs and the awareness um, uh, team, really. Uh, so basically, what we try to do is um, really have these people that is in the field that is every day in front of the animals, they should be the ones really knowing what's going on globally, right? And if they see any weird um, symptom or anything uh, strange, they can notify quickly. So that's really the first line of early detection and rapid response. Now, how we do that, education and training is essential, not just farmers, again, veterinarians, but also, again, as I said, next generation leaders in, in this area. So I've worked a lot here at UC Davis to build my program mostly. I teach mostly graduate students. So um, all the students that after vet school decide to go to masters and PhDs. Um, so try to combine all these methods in, in those classes, make classes that are problem solving oriented, with all these different skills and R code is essential for this. Try to integrate multidisciplinary and multidisciplines 
uh, also multiple uh, teams uh, together. So we have here, for example, the team that we work uh, veterinarians with computer scientists in a couple of projects that we have. Uh, so it's, it's really important to have this, uh, you know, uh, collaboration with different groups. The classes are, are quite uh, interactive, so people has to, you know, when we are in person, we they have to write in the boards, work in teams, uh, and and do a lot of data uh, science really. So we we do, uh, you know, deal with a lot of dirty data. Here's it's kind of an example. I think it's cute for you know uh, vision, <laughs> and and you you have uh, you know models that can recognize uh, the chihuahua right in, in in this picture is really well even if sometimes honestly I would say that this this picture could could be very similar to this one, um, so again we're training the next generation of veterinarian data scientists which I think is is really key in the future. We did a lot of courses in this regard with OIE and FAO uh, reference labs. Um, for example, I, I put you to some examples in Spain. We bring people from all Europe and many different countries represented from Russia to, um, you know, uh, we had uh, Germany, Poland, um, Italy, Bulgaria, and, and many different places. We had also people from China. Uh, we went to Lanzhou and we had uh, two weeks with them working with different people from many different provinces in China, uh, training the same thing, people in the lab and in epidemiology. We did one also in uh, Ivory Coast and, and, and we had great experience. We had representatives here from Togo, Benin, uh, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, and, and, different, and different people. So these are some examples of in-country based uh, training, but we also have digital simulations, kind of video game uh, to train what's going on or early detection of problems and what you should do next in the format of, again, kind of video game or adventures, graphic adventures, uh, pictures and that the students found really interesting to, to get trained and try to identify what they should do, how they, what kind of questions they should ask, what kind of material I should bring into the farm with this uh, kind of suspicious, um, you know, history or evaluation. Um, we also did this in person. So we did record uh, real simulation exercises in different farms in which we involved all the government, even the police came, like closed the farm and they had to do testing and so on. They did all that uh, because they didn't know that was like a fake um, right uh, outbreak. But um, all these experiences have been really good. We, we did those in different places. So what we learned with this was a lot, it was first to try to assess how the first responders, veterinarians and so on, really respond against suspicious. Are they really ready for this? Uh, what are the strengths and weakness? And what are the recommendations that we can provide to improve rapid response and early detection? So with this global strategy, again, I built uh, the team here in my, in my center, in the Canon Center, tried to come up with this um, strategy to, to have interdisciplinary problem solving oriented approach, try to combine research, teaching, service, and make sure that you know, we are putting together um, you know, people from many different perspectives. Um, so we do have a lot of um, you know, types of people, by, by engineers, programmers, project managers, of course, a lot of students and undergrad students, visitor scholars, at least three to five per year. We work really closely with, with many places, uh, many different organizations. We have, these are some of the partners that we work currently with. It's extremely interesting to bring, again, um, some of these fellows. We also send students over there and, and have collaborations with them. And at the end of the day, the perspective is, yeah, try to have this one health uh, feeling, domestic wildlife, human perspective with transboundary animal disease, uh, focus on, on you know, many different species, but also try to develop whatever we develop and uh, try to implement it in tools that can be used by end users. So that's what we do. We have developed this disease bioportal open access platform basically tries to integrate all this information and be help to visualize and analyze the data in a more meaningful way uh, to, to really accelerate the way we do surveillance of animal diseases. Um, so big group of people and collaborators and definitely open to more. <laughs> we are growing every day and, and we have national and international collaborators uh, that are extremely um, fantastic. 
uh, to work with. And, and these are some of my students. So I really want to, I don't know if I ran a lot or, or not, but um, yeah, that's, that's basically um, what I really wanted to share with you. And I'm super open to, to questions and any comment that you guys uh, wanna have. Thank you so much. Great, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, Dr. Martinez. This was really wonderful. And thanks for sharing, you know, to start your journey and all the work that you're doing. So I think we have a little over, let's see, yeah, a little over 10 minutes for questions. So I encourage the fellows to ask questions at this moment. Sure. Okay, so we have, we have a question from Frank. Um, Mm -hmm. It's clear currently you have leadership roles, you teach, and you can still carry out research and publish your work. Could you, could you be having any tips on how to juggle different roles, especially for people interested in academic research tracks? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it's definitely not easy to combine all these things. So because um, as, you, as you understand, most of our uh, positions, like my job, for example, so it's supposed to be 50% research, 50% teaching, right? But in addition, you have to do surveys. And also I have to do administration as the director of the, <laughs> of the center. So you have 150% uh, of time, <laughs> more or less, uh, uh, you know, in, in your daily basis. So it's a little bit complicated. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork and, you know, service requirements, like being part of committees and so on. Mm -hmm. But this all is, is great. And I think my suggestion for, for many of you, and it was uh, the suggestion I got actually from many of my mentors when I arrived to UC Davis, is uh, really try to learn to balance um, all these things. Make sure that you have your priority in, in mind, like what where you want to go in terms of from now to the future, if you're an assistant professor or you are you know, a postdoc or something, you want to jump into academia. Okay, what kind of things you have to check? Well, the important things definitely is publications, make sure that you have a good record of publications and, you know, research work. Uh, you definitely need to try to get funding. And, and for funding, again, it's really important to build a good network and, and to have good teams to work with. This is something that you learn when, when you do it. I mean, at the beginning, probably you just, are excited to collaborate in anything, but but I would suggest to focus probably in, in few projects first and, and try to make those projects successful and make sure that those are the projects you wanna work with um, and with the team that you wanna work with. Um, and, and again, the funding at the beginning is hard to get, but as soon as you know, you know the, the different channels of funding, not just competitive funding, but sometimes also foundations or, you know, contracts and, you know, you, you have to explore and diversify sometimes the risk in terms of uh, funding capture. Um, so again, as soon as you have these two things, right? Mm -hmm. Then all the other things like service, definitely you need service. You need to check all these points in order to be, you know, and move forward from assistant to associate, but also try to learn to say no. It's extremely important. It's something that doesn't work for me, unfortunately. I think I, I say yes much more than no, and it's bad. I think that you should have a balance between yes and no's um, and, and try to make sure that you can commit if you say yes to some service or to, to some um, you know, committees or so on, but they take a lot of your time. So sometimes, again, I think many junior faculty or or the students and you know that try to become faculty, they get overwhelmed with the amount of things that they have to do. And many of those things, again, they are taking and distracting you from the main projects or the main ideas that you want to develop and, and really launch as, as your career focus, right? Um, so that's that's what I would suggest. I mean, and, and also try to yeah, be open to opportunities. Sometimes um, you realize that within your department, you have amazing collaborators, but outside your department, you even have more. And, and there are people that are super excited to work with. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's good to be open to, you know, a strange experience to sometimes again, when we started here, um, I, I got reached out by many people, for example, working with bees and working in animal science and, mm -hmm. And some of those collaborations came up 
and and we're really excited and actually work out very well. So just you know these these things can happen. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback and guidance. Um, any additional questions for Dr. Martinez? Mm -hmm. This is your chance to uh, get her wisdom. Don't be shy. <laughs> so we have, we still have about seven minutes. I, I want to honor our time and we want to end in time, but um, any, any questions? Uh, hi, Dr. Martinez. Thank you so much for that interesting presentation. I just noticed that you, you had, um, is it 14 publications from your postdoc? And I was just wondering how you managed to do that. How long was your postdoc? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually did two postdocs. So one was uh, two years, and then I did another one that was one year and a half. So yeah, approximately three years and a half um, you have to, to get that. But, but again, um, it's, it's a great point. After you finish the PhD, okay, you, you do have a different kind of role or status. At that time, when I was postdoc, I was leading a small group of five people. So I was, you know, five PhD students and, and two masters actually also um, that were doing their thesis and so on. So many of those you're mentoring. So you, you start being more mentor, more in a mentoring role. And that really opens the possibility that, you know, you, you have a lot of publications because your students are, you know, starting to publish and you're also involved in those publications. So, so that's something that's really good. The, the teamwork definitely is, allows you to do more than you have to do all the paper by yourself and then, you know, submit to your mentors, which is something you have to, I mean, do, and still I do definitely, but, but once you have your own students, now I have um, like, I think it's eight PhD students, usually on average per year, plus two, three master's students. Um, so that, again, each of those students may publish one paper or two per year. So, so you can imagine that, you know, the publication records uh, can improve and then increase a lot. I would say though, that sometimes, you know, mentoring those students takes definitely more time than doing the paper yourself. <laughs> For sure, uh, but <laughs> but that's part of, of the thing as well, like and guide them through the process of publishing their own first papers and, and things like that. But yeah, that's that's the main reason. But it was a very productive time. The main reason is was um, we had the right people, like people that was already trained. We had a lot of collaborations and different European programs that allow us to be very productive. We have the data. We have you know, the, the machine already running, I would say. Um, so you could focus on publishing a lot. That's great. Well, thank you for your response. And I would say that maybe we can conclude with this additional, very important question from Chipo. Uh, so how do you balance your work life with your personal life? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And I, I don't think I have the right answer for this one. <laughs> I think that uh, you definitely need to balance because if not, it really, yeah, it, it kills you. And um, even if you're, I'm, I would define myself like a little bit workaholic and extremely passionate about my work. So um, that makes things easy for me, right? So I, I can dedicate as many hours as needed and, and so on. Now you definitely need to balance the personal life, and and you know I have fortunately a husband that is also working in research, and so he understands. <laughs> but and you know we are pretty much on the same page in that sense. But but you need to stop at some point, make sure that you have a line very well defined, saying well, enough is enough. We'll do this tomorrow, right? I cannot just work, you know, from seven in the morning to eight at night every day. So so you definitely need to put you know for yourself. Um, productivity also because if not you become exhausted and then you know burnout and, and you won't be produ productive or creative so you definitely need to put boundaries and, and, and try to enjoy your work try to commit to the things that you can do like say no to those that are potentially you know not um, priorities for you or they could overcommit you um, and make sure that you you come up with the priorities for your time yeah. Great. Thank well, you. 
Yeah, well, thank you very much for your time, uh, Dr. Martinez. And, and I wanna also uh, make sure that if our fellows have additional questions, I'm, I'm hopeful that you know, they can contact you for yeah, guidance definitely. and more questions. Okay, great. Absolutely. And, and, and thank you all yeah. the fellows, yeah, for joining. And I know I, I applaud your commitment and I saw Asteria like driving while listening to uh, Dr. Martinez. So I was gonna say, be careful, but I applaud your commitment and um, attention at this time. So thank you all. And we'll probably see each other again uh, next month. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, great, bye.